Vajrasapa Samaya Manikalaya Vajrasapa Tena Patista Jira Mabawa Satoshi Mabawa Satoshi Mabawa Anuranga Mabawa Sarva Siddha Mikriyacha Sarva Karma Suchane Chiram Chiram Kuru Ham Ha 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 Bhagavan Sarva Tathagata Vajra Mame Mucha Vajra Bawa Maha Samaya Sadhva Ah, okay. So it's good to be back. Nothing beats home. Uh, it was a uh, wonderful retreat. Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, Florida Mindfulness. Uh, he was originally or you could say continuing in the tradition of Thich Nhat Hanh, um, but he's also, he's also Zen, uh, and he's also uh, Dzogchen. And so um, he has a very unique uh, Dharma Center. They purchased the church, and as soon as they purchased it, well, not as soon as they purchased it, then they purchased the land um, and the building beside it, and they built a retreat center. And then COVID hit, and everything was was uh, shut down. Um, and so they uh, have been rebuilding the last the last years. And it's just a lovely, lovely, lovely place uh, to visit. So we had around uh, a little over two hundred people in the retreat. Um, uh, many of them were. Uh, they they remembered I was there five years ago, <laughs> and this is the first time in five years, uh, and so it was really good to see all my old friends. <clears throat> they love Donald Voce, and uh, and they even uh, worked on a couple of the songs to sing, you know, to us. Uh, uh, during during the retreat, but um, especially they wanted to do a waking mind, um, and but we went on and we played we played Santis and it was so wonderful. I'm always forgetting cards. You know they pack my cards, but I never pack them out so they can download the. You know the more airplay we get. Or the more downloads I think it, we get, the more whoever plays them on whatever, Spotify or Apple or whatever, the more it will get airtime, the more people download. So I take the cards to pass out for people to download, but then I, no, I don't think about it while I'm there. But we did, and we ran out of cards on Friday, Thursday night or Friday night. Friday, by Friday, we were, we were. We were out of cards, and so, um, but I was just really glad to know that that people are beginning to uh, uh, listen to the songs and and that they that they do like them. We have a new album coming out in January. Um, we just can't get to the recording stage, uh, um, recording studio because. Yeah, Kadar is going to be going to Cambodia. Cambodia in two weeks, and Busita is already gone for a 30 day um, um, silent retreat um, and practice retreat. Uh, so, today I wanted to talk about something that the Buddha, you know, I don't know if I'll ever get to the back of, to the back of expounding. Um, I'm still, I'm still in the hundreds. I know you all on Tuesdays and Fridays uh, are beyond that. But every time I go back to the beginning, I understand things entirely, not entirely different, but I add to my understanding and I can penetrate it. He said entering is entering the, the stream or entering an ocean. It's whether you stay on the surface whether you go midway, you know, under the water, or whether you go all the way down to the bottom, it's still called entering. And so 
the difference is whether you enter and tread water or enter and, and go deep. And so um, when we talk about a, a beginner's mind, that's not exactly the right idea. I like that idea about entering and choosing to tread, choosing to go midway or going deep. Uh, so the revelation and the liberation the, comes from going deep. Uh, it's not really about going wide. It's about going deep. 84,000 um, teachings and methods are designed to uh, so that you can find the right one for you. A actually, in the Majima Nikaya, they talked about, oh no, the uh, uh, Vasudhi Maga, they talked about um, in the section on seek seeking a meditation object from the teacher, right? And the teacher would give a, a particular meditation object um, uh, according to a person's mind. Some it's according to a person's mind. Some it's according to a person's interest. Because what you're interested in, you'll do that. What you're not interested in, I don't care how many initiations you get or whatever, if you're really not interested in it, you're going to do it for a little while, and then you're going to abandon it. Why? Because you didn't really have an affinity for it. It was something you thought you were getting or gaining so that you could ad advance or ex accelerate. So the wanting it was for the acceleration, not because one had an affinity for it. And um, that's why so many people get diff uh, practices to do, and then they, you know, in a month or two months or three months or six months, they drop them off. Every practice I got in Christianity, I still have it today because the affinity was there for that to, you know, to open to that type of, uh, to that kind of view. Uh, and there was an affinity with the, with the beings and so it was easy. It wasn't like doing a practice. I didn't understand what you meant by practice until I became a Buddhist. Because in Christianity, we don't have anything called practice. You know, it's it, it's it's our it's our view, our relationship, and our way. You know, a way of living in the world. It's not practice. I'm sorry that that Dharma was introduced in that way, like like practice, because I think it handicaps. A, a lot of people, it doesn't become real life and really a part of their life and their mood and their attitude and their refuge. It doesn't truly become a refuge. It's a practice. It's a practice. Um, and so, uh, so a lot of times when I'm talking about dharmic things, I talk from a Christian perspective because I could say that there, uh, I learned what true immersion was and I learned what true relationship is and how you can have a relationship um, with these concepts that go beyond mere words and actually become part uh, and parcel of who and, and 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 what you are. So today I want to talk a little bit because I know we really enjoy our Tuesdays and our Fridays when we get to discuss the Dharma, you know, and what it means and um and I just want to make sure that I'm kind of keeping that balance. He said, do not ponder, do not habitually ponder, ponder things. Pondering is tracing the root of something. Uh, do not conceptualize. Conceptualizing is bringing up ideas in your current mind consciousness. Do not ponder, do not conceptualize, do not, and do not seek and investigate. I tell you who learned Buddha Dharma, all of you many disciples here, I tell you that most of you here like to seek and investigate, looking for your original nature and looking for the flavor of emptiness. That is called seek and investigate. If you seek and investigate, however, you will not find what you are searching for because your deluded thinking will block you. How could you make use of that? But if you put aside seeking and investigating, what you are searching for will appear. It's like carrying a baby on your back and then looking for that baby. You'll never find it. That's why the saying goes, do not ponder, do not conceptualize, and do not seek 
and investigate, relying and depending on nothing, just act naturally. The mind consciousness does not rely on depend or depend on anything at any place. Just be completely natural. Do not care about that there is cultivated power or is Buddha or, or is Dharma. Do not care about that. He said this is why they were so successful in penetrating uh, to the truth in the Jaomen Monastery. That was the one where you sign a paper coming in that, you know, they just tell you what to do. You just do that thing. And if you, like, when they hit the bell and it means walk, you just walk. Don't think about walking. I don't feel like walking. How will I walk? You hear the bell, like Pavlov dog, you just move. And when they hit the bell, you just stop. And when they hit the bell, you picked up the water. And when they hit the bell, you put down the water. And it was just to to train you to like just hear the instruction and follow the instruction. It was a uh, it really uh, you had to have that kind of trust and confidence in the instruction that to hear it was to operate in it and for it to to reveal itself or operate operate through you. Uh, and so they signed a paper that any time they. Uh, you know, and basically, if they didn't just immediately execute, then they were thinking about it, or you know, and and it, and you sign a paper allowing them to beat you to a cudgel, I think they called it, or something like something like that. And out of that came like the Zen tradition, where like if you nod or something, they whack you on the back to like wake you up and thank you to for wake it um, for rouse, rousing you. And that was the that was the opposite of just stepping out on the instruction. Was well, getting so dull minded that in meditation you you you, um, you drift off to to uh, to sleep. So he says, no, you you have to conquer the state of Buddha Dhammas through theories. You have to conquer them. Through theories, that's why you must understand things from the perspective of theories. Uh, but then you, and the theories are designed to explain, and then you drop it. So, so we should be careful when we're delving too deeply into what I think that means for me, you know, because. They're self-explanatory. They're telling you what it means. So we don't really have to think so much about what it means. It's a matter of we can take it at its value for what it says. Um, so um, he says, you cannot intentionally seek the truth, nor can you intentionally uh, end delusion. So we have to realize that there's really neither practice nor non-practice in cultivating yourself. Um, so you need not intentionally make the cultivation overly elaborate. So on one hand, he's telling you cultivate, cultivate, cultivate. And on the other hand, he's telling you, you know, just act naturally. And and you have to find a, where where that space is where you know when I'm putting forth effort, but my heart's not in it, or when I'm not putting forth the effort that I know I can put it. Only you uh, individually, me individually can tell where that space is. So what I wanted to talk about today to kind of help us get an inkling, an idea about what that space is, is, uh, and I have a title for the day, because I actually did it a day in advance, um, the message came. Um, but it was the explanation is not the truth. The explanation is not the truth, or is, you could say, oh, it's not the true thing, the true thing. And if we could really get that, um, I want to try to take us through an exercise so that we can sort of understand what that means 
and how to apply it. When something comes up, there's uh, a situation comes up and we find ourselves, you know, um, having a, a reaction to it. Uh, and, and it can be, you know, and, and we always well, label that, you know, you know, uh, it's a worry. It's a, uh, it could be fear. It could be um, loneliness, cleverness, uh, um, afraid that our behavior or what we want to exhibit in front of somebody is not going to be up to up to par or or how it has been. Uh, you know, but we we put words to how we are feeling. We feel anxious. We have some anxiety. Um, and and once we put it into words, then we begin, we've lost our ground. Um, we've lost our ground once we put it into words. Truly, when something happens, there is a, a, a feeling, it's a bodily feeling. But if we take the position that it, it is a pleasant, or it's unpleasant, or it's a neutral feeling. Without labeling the feeling, uh, we can make more. We can make more progress because we're actually separating the feeling, the bodily feeling, from the uh, the psychological e experience. Um, we uh, we take it away from words that we can attach to to define ourselves. Uh, to even define this experience. He said, but if you leave it in pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral, you could go a little deeper into um, recognizing that it is just a feeling. It only becomes a specific feeling when we label it. When we label it, it becomes a specific kind of feeling. So we always talk then like, how do you feel? Oh, I feel sad. I feel, you know, we we have put so much emphasis into the words that describe it that that we attach to the words. And the only way out of that is to detach it from the words. So we have to separate the words that we use from the feeling. Um, so, you know, that's why I talk a lot about being triggered by a word, you know, because of, uh, without the word, the feeling is only pleasant, unpleasant. I mean, I, you know, like basically it's a sensation. The feeling is a sensation. So can you separate words from the feeling? If not, you're caught in words. Yeah. Does the feeling exist by itself? Is it just um, an, a sensation? But with the words, with the words, it becomes something specific. And so, um, so just thinking that the sensation is not the word, you know, uh, will help us. We the 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 teacher will give. Um, the you know the teacher will 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 give us something and we will repeat it and we'll keep repeating it because we're coming from that intellectual space. I have some people who call me all the time and they're repeating the Dharma. You know, uh, they're repeating what's said, but in their behavior, nothing is changing. Nothing is changing. They're just repeating, uh, just repeating the words. Um, for instance, we think about um, uh, loneliness. Uh, so how do you think that loneliness comes about or becomes something, a debilitating um, uh, action? I won't say response, debilitating action in your life. How, do, how does that come about? What kind of action do we take based on the feeling of loneliness? No. What makes you say, I am lonely? Attaching to the feeling? Your hindrances from the past. 
feeling cut off from other people. How would you know that you're lonely? Ah, so you think about it. <sighs> How would you know? What what are you thinking? Like, where are you seated when you are aware of or you're surmising and grasping that word lonely, loneliness? We're, we're thinking of ourselves. That's right. Yeah. So self-centeredness, you know, so so loneliness comes when our day is just uh, full of self self-centeredness. You don't think I'm lonely when you're thinking about others or when you're doing something for others or when you, you know, uh, contemplating, you know, the, the plight of others or when you're appreciating others or when you're recognizing others. But from a seat of self-centeredness comes lon loneliness, you know. And so, so it takes time to just kind of sit with the feeling separated from words and then uh and and agree basically that a feeling is just a feeling and it's pleasant it's unpleasant or it's neither pleasant or nor um or not pleasant so so it would help us if we don't make a problem out of our discontent whatever we're discontent about you know and when we talk about in this life, um, I, I, I love Joe said to me one time, he said, you know, at this point in my life, all I'm, I'm focusing on is contentment, just being content in, with whatever is arising in the moment, being con just, just being contented. I'm not grasping after anything. I'm not longing for something I don't want to have. I know I don't have. I'm just trying to find contentment or accept contentment or abide in contentment in the present moment. And so that that allows or gives an invitation, you know, for us to to re really step out of ourselves because that's the only way that contentment is gonna is gonna be found. Um, uh, so but so we normally just make a problem out of out of, we just create a problem for ourselves out of our feeling of discontent about something, one thing or another. But Buddha Master says that when, when we feel this way um, and why it's important for us to not be in a, where we have a mind of practice nor non-practice. So you might not hear me talk that much about practice. First, I get practice in your body, but now I might not. I might take it, take it away because we're leaning too far to to one side until too much efforting um, come comes in. Uh, so you must know that you cannot intentionally seek the truth, nor can you in intentionally in delusion. So don't be attached to truth or delusion. Accord with just as it is, with non-abiding. Therefore, one should leave behind what one has derived from hearing, thinking, practicing, and learning, even what one has derived from thinking and hearing the Dharma should be abandoned. Now, all sorts of intelligence includes all scattered intelligence and after all of that is completely left behind the remaining wisdom of prajna and true emptiness seems to remain yet not remain and being in that state you thoroughly awaken to true emptiness you naturally and thoroughly awaken you instantly know it and because there is nothing to attain and no differentiation there is neither that state of neither practice nor non-practice. Um, there is nothing attained because if anything is attained, only the mind consciousness knows what is attained. There is nothing whatsoever that can be attained 
In other words, we cannot attain our own original appearance. So um, that's what allows us to drop into the like the gap between if we think about attainment uh, or we think about non-attainment, we're still in the thinking mode. It says nothing can be attained from the thinking mode. So um, we, um, we have to be careful to balance out. That's why it's good to hear it, but hear it like water washing over you, as opposed to drinking all the water that's come and drinking all the water. We would hold all the water in us until we literally burst, you know, but we'd never be clean. But if we just allow the water to wash over us, then it starts to, in a very natural way, um, um, uh, wash the mind or cleanse the consciousness of all of the seeds that are in, embedded there so that neither can the, um, the uh, seeds that will bring destruction nor see that's why I'm, I'm careful about using the word uh, create. Now, it's, we're big today, you know, on talking about create, creating things and and creation and, and the mind creating because it's uh it's too closely aligned with the the ego perspective. That, that we have, you know, sometimes the word can completely throw you, throw you off base or keep you from where you're trying to go simply because of our attachment to words and the connotation that words, uh, words have, have for us. So he said, there is deepness and there is shallowness and deepness and shallowness are spoken in, in relation to one another, they're relative terms. So a lot of what we think is going deep is actually remaining shallow, shallow because we are using our words, our words and our thinking, thinking mind to to understand them, to speak of them, to be with with them, you know. And so uh, uh, maybe more. Maybe some people need to break things down more, but that's really not what what we what we should what that's not the direction from where we sit and where 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 we're um, where we're going at this at this time. Um, so this this kind of deepness. And, and I mean, and just think about it, you know, because I have been, I've been thinking about the times I've been so intense and so intense and so intense and in trying to decipher and understand, get the words down, you know, understand what they mean, um, and how how to use them, how to apply them. But he says you don't have to. It's just like how a child observe their parents, you know, but that's why we came up with don't do as I do, do as I say do, because they they would catch something more than they learned it by what we said, what we what we said to them. And that's so why so many of us who lived in traumatic situations that said we never do what our father did or what our mother did, we do that very thing, you know, because we we picked it up uh, um, and it actually bypasses the mind. One therapist told me that the mind does not know a negative. So you can't use not. If you say, um, I will not do something, you know, then the mind just drops off the not. And I don't know if that's I don't know if that's true or not. Um, but just if you suppose you got it in your mind that the if the brightness of wisdom is obstructed, you know, because it's in the depths, then um, then the only way 
that you can get to the depths is that one would have to let go of our superficial thinking about it or, or trying to think about it because the mind that created our, our reality is not gonna be the mind that can, can uh, unravel it for us. That we're not gonna be able to see the truth through this uh, consciousness that has um, outpictured or created a reality for us to live in. I don't care how much I break it down, chop it down, analyze it. And so that's why he says it's not good to analyze. So if you hear and you just let it wash over you. Uh, and then later on, you'll encounter a situation and because you're not attached to it in any particular way, according, like I heard it on Thursday and Thursday was a bad day, you know? So then when, um, so I have it in my, I have something in my mind based on the situation on Thursday, you know, that gets all mixed in there because it's tied in with our, uh, our sense gates, you know? That's how we're kind of putting together our information. And so the way I heard it on Thursday would be a better way to say it because you might have heard it on Friday. And if you had heard it on Friday, you would have heard it an entirely different way based on what was happening on Friday, based on the mood you were in on Friday, based on your sense of, of, of um, uh, openness on Friday, but Thursday was a bad day, you know, and so you heard things in a, in a certain way. And this is, that's why we have to be careful about our mind. Sometimes we make, we hear things according to, uh, or based on what we just heard, and that gives us a particular, a particular view. So if we heard two different things, and then we together heard this same thing, then each one of us may have a different uh, um, idea or view of what we what we just what we just heard because we are influenced, we're using memory. So a lot of what we call critical thinking is not really critical thinking. It's based on memory, based on what I heard or what I saw last week based on the the mood that I was in when I heard it or who I heard it from, or, you know, I can hear something from one person and something from another, and this I can totally accept and that I'm not even trying to hear it because of the person that it's coming from. And, the, you know, my own discriminating mind and what I think, all of that's mixed up. All of that's mixed up in it. Um, so I'm I'm saying that so that and that doesn't mean then like you just read something and just just keep reading just keep reading just keep reading but he says you read it you 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 ponder that to come to an understanding of the meaning and then you drop it drop it you and then you forget about it. and it's like a gentle rain it just begins to soak in so your understanding comes at a very deep, at a very deep level. Now the thing is that when uh, you when you understand something for yourself, it doesn't mean that you can help somebody else to understand it. So you might think, well, if you know it, you can explain it. If you don't, you don't know it. And in a sense, that can be true, but it can also equally be true that your understanding is for you. It's for you to understand. It's for you to know. And, uh, and we want more to share our understanding than, than we want or, um, and we can get really excited about what we understand. And that creates for us a kind of attachment to our understanding because for everything I think I understand, I can tell you there's probably a thousand under, uh, uh, other ways to look at it, a thousand other ways to understand. As soon as I lock around, I have the correct understanding 
of this and fasten to it, I get locked into that as the understanding. That is the understanding. And so I become um, uh, unable to uh, be open to the uh, flowing wisdom of Prajna that helps us to understand, you know, truth in its totality, which includes, you know, the person, the situation, and all and all of that. And that's the difference in just knowing Dharma and uh, penetrating or allowing it to penetrate uh, in, in such a way that it can be useful to everybody and that we can easily um, uh, adjust, we can easily shift with each coming uh, uh, each circumstance that comes in into our life, but when we think we we know, we think we you know, um, when we fasten down on any part of the dharma, then we lose the capacity to have the flexibility for prajna to manifest in uh, in in the moment. Um, uh, Krishna Murdy, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, said one time. It's um, he said it's no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly <laughs> sick society, you know. And so, if we're always thinking about what we know in relationship to the society, then we're going to be in in bad shape. And that's what we generally do. We generally assess our accomplishment in comparison oh. to the thoughts of, of others, the thoughts of, of a sick, of a sick society. And we think, well, like we went pretty good, you know, or we we feel uh, a sense of of I know of I know. Um, but if we um, honestly, uh, I personally feel like I know nothing. When Bodhidharma um, went to China, and took the Dharma to China, I'm, I'm wondering how he did it. You know, he was so accomplished in the Dharma. And uh, I think the, the emperor came by and he asked him something. I don't know if it was the emperor, but I, I believe it was some high-ranking official. And every question he asked, asked him, he said, I don't know. You know, he said, what good are you? Uh, what you? And he didn't know the answer. He didn't know the answer to that either. And so here he is, he's going to take the Dharma and um, and his whole and all his answers are I don't know. And he went oh, when he got there, and he sat in a cave for twelve for twelve more years, you know. So I think about um, I think about his example and what he's saying when he thought he knew he went to carry it and take it to another country. By the time he got there in his preparation, he had become halfway I'll just say halfway selfless until he had no confidence in himself and what he thought he knew and what he thought he had to teach and to tell people. And he sat there for, for 12 more years. Um, and so uh, uh, I, I wonder sometimes now having the lesson that um, that we have had when we got a direction, a directive to go and do something and by in preparing to go do it and setting out to do it, you know, the the goodness of that is that, um, or at least I, for one, am finding out my insufficiency, you know, more in recognition of what I don't know than what I, you know, than what I, what I do know. And it helps you. It helps you to really stay humble and so that you can know what you don't know. But if you already think you know, there is no room for something else, uh, for something else to come in. Um, 
And so I'm finding my uh, uh, my journey at this point so uh, so inviting, so so really really delightful because it's taking away from me uh, like a need to intellectually know. Um, and if you're trying to find that place of neither inside nor outside, if you're trying to find that place of non-differentiation, you cannot use the power of differentiation to find that space of non-differentiation. It's, it's not possible. It's just not possible. So that's where I have to trust and have confidence that prajna is self revealing, you know, and uh, and that I can only come to know from abiding in a place of not knowing. Um, uh, I don't know if that um, if that makes sense to you or not because it. Uh, But when we're not grasping to anything, there, right there, is that that place of peace. So um, sometimes people ask me, and somebody at this retreat asked asked me, um, you know, how do I reconcile my views um, of, of of Christianity with my with my Dominant views. I was like, I'm not trying to reconcile. I'm not trying to reconcile anything. You know, I am trying to live in the moment. And when inspiration, the thing about inspiration is you can't pull inspiration up. Inspiration comes up. And when it comes up, then I, you know, I, um, I am just with that, that which inspires me at, at the moment. So all I'm doing is trying to abide uh, in a space that that constant inspiration can be there uh, to guide me, not my memories that influence my thinking, but, but to be open, fresh, like naked uh, for what is what is emerging or what is coming, what is coming up, what is uh, fresh. Mm. I could say, I could say fresh. It's like new every morning. Every, even when I hear a repeat of some, uh, of some truth, how it hits me, how it lands on me. Uh, gives me my my sense of how I will move out through my through my day. So sometimes we say like in the morning, you know, uh, that's why we rely upon like our precept and a vow, you know, of what we will do. And then I'm relying on that vow to have a, a, a quality or a property that will will guide me. Throughout throughout the day. Otherwise, the, my only fallback is my memory and what's in my own mind. You know, uh, so the reliance is um, more than reliance on mere words that are spoken, but 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 entering into the um, the words have to take on a certain kind of life. And we, and, and we are touched by that in a way that our discriminating mind that has all of these memories stored into it cannot influence, cannot influence us. And that's how we get a new idea a new way of handling something, a new way of looking at something. We just call it, I have a new way, or I have a different, I have a different way 
of looking at it. Or it was like, oh, it came to me to do this. Um, so all worldly dharma is Buddha dharma in that in that sense that that we can operate or be in this kind of a flow that we're not attached, you know. Uh, and just to know something, learn something, but then don't be don't be attached to it. Uh, just act naturally, and so that means that that we have to uh, really have to give grace to one another because it takes time. To, it's like learning to tie your shoe. I mean, it takes time to learn how to tie it and not knot it. So a lot of times when we are, are improving, you know, we just need a ground where we can, can make these changes, you know, in an atmosphere of acceptance or in an atmosphere of, of um, you know, just uh, in a, in a non-judging you know, in a non-judging atmosphere. And we have to balance, uh, figure out how to balance those those things, those things out. So this is really where um that uh, actually that's what practice is. It's not like by rote saying something over and over or reading something over and over, you know, um or or doing a ritual over and over. Uh, it is not the, the doing of the ritual that is the thing, but it's it's like the um it's what is seeping into you and bringing up out of you your dependence upon analysis, examination, and analysis. Uh, so, so it's like lifting a weight, you know, when you start, like I started with uh, two pound weights, and I'll tell you, two pound weights, after about the fifth curl, uh -huh. they feel like 10 pounds, you know? Um, and, but, but, but doing it every day, then they feel like one pound. You know, you're ready to go, uh, you're ready naturally to go to another, uh, another, another way. Uh, and so that's how we should uh, do the dom. So we do these things to get into the habit. Actually, we're just shifting, exchanging uh, one habit for another habit, but then it's not like a habit at all. You know, it's just how we are or what we do um, without any thought of I am doing, I am doing this. No thought of I am doing this. So on one hand, I guess we should have patience when people repeat things over and over but don't live it. You know, maybe um, maybe we uh, find some irritation or attachment. I'm always looking to see how this dharma like what's Panwadi need? You know, it might be my my role to to share it, but that won't help me. <laughs> you know, that won't help me. Like not when I die, it won't help me while I'm living. You know, uh, uh, so I'm always thinking, like how do how do I apply, apply? Do I experience irritation when someone's constantly calling me to tell me about the dharma that they know? But they, uh, it's like the black belts used to come to our dojo, you know, and, you know, haven't been in dojo for 10 years. They're all fat. Uh, you know, we like, uh, that's why I ain't wear mine. When I start practicing, I took mine, I, I never put it on again. Um, because uh, Pani Deep and I would laugh about the guys who would come in, and, you know, trying, trying to do a, a round house to the face and they can't get their leg up. Have somebody's knee, you know, and uh, uh, so uh, yeah. But so I'm always looking to see how I can apply because I do get irritated sometimes, you know. Um, but this is telling me that I need to work. I need to work on it. That's a deficiency. That's a deficiency in in me. Number one, it it, it takes me off of my own vow, you know. Because at that time, I'm not thinking about 
say that person, you know, um, may, uh, having happiness and, and the causes of happiness. You know, I'm like, why don't they practice? Then, you know, so that's that might be how, how I'm thinking. So at that moment, when that irritation is arising in me, I, you know, if I was in the habit of, 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 of uttering my, my the four great vows, then, then that's what would come up immediately is um, um, wanting not for them to do their practice, but wanting them to have happiness and you know maintain the causes of happiness and not be separated from, you know, um, and seeing that they really want to uh, to uh, emulate, you know, the qualities, um, the qualities, you know, of the, of the good Sangha, the qualities of the accomplished Sangha. And that's why they're constantly mentioning it, mentioning it, you know, and, uh, and so maybe my response would be a little bit different than, than it is. And, and, and to know what needs to be said in that moment means that you have to have no attachment to it, you know? So that lets me know I have some attachment to it. And so right away, you know, it's the finger that's pointing back at, at, at myself. Now, that's what practice that's what practice is. Uh, so I just want to open up for uh, uh, for any any questions or any um, comments um, here, leaving with you the thought of realizing that there is neither practice nor non-practice. One need not intentionally make cultivation overly elaborate. And then this is where we get into the different levels of wisdom-based insight. insight. So. Hello. Yeah. Um, hi, it's good to see you. Good to see you. Um, it's been a while. It's really good to be back. I just want to comment very quickly that um, I'm just so glad to hear your talk today and how deeply it resonates with me. Um, if I could just share a lie. Um, a couple of days ago, I just got quiet. I mean, really quiet. No phone, no nothing, with a lot of centering prayer. And um, honest to God, everything you just said came to me. And I just can't even believe I'm here. Every bit of it. And as I got in touch, there's something here, my solar plexus. I would notice that I would start to tell a story about this point right here. For some reason, it was right here while I was in prayer. And I noticed the story and how it made this feel or something. I'm not sure, I'm sure what it was for it. And I thought about the practice and I thought about all this ego I have around, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that, and how, how hard I am on myself and how I hold myself back because I still have, like I had in corporate, these goals. But didn't know it. it was like an unwitting, uh, unwittingly. And um, I remember just sitting and thinking how deceptively simple, but I really could recognize I can't think through things. I, I can't heal through thinking. And I'm, I really have to just trust whatever's happening here. And that's all I wanted to say, because I'm so glad to be back. I appreciate your, your share today, and it just validates that the spirit is still within me mm -hmm. and helping me. And I'm um, just very grateful. Mm -hmm. And you know, you know, mostly we run away, we use our words and our thinking to run away from the feeling. Uh, and so we push away or ignore or as soon as the feeling starts to rise up it bodily, you know, then then we try to circumvent that. The mind steps in to help us out, you know. But part of this practice really does require that we just <clears throat> sit and experience what is happening in the body, you know. And apart from where it's difficult, is 
um, it's difficult for us to not think about what it is, you know, what is this I'm feeling? Why am I feeling this way? It's just being with the feeling, you know, feeling. And noticing that the feeling it needs something to feed on, you know. And there was a breakthrough when you are released from that feeling. If it has nothing to hang on to, that that gives it an identity. Um, yeah. And when we uh, do that continually, you know, uh, it helps us to get. Uh, to detach these two in a way that we can be aware of them, but not grasping as I, as, as I. So I've been doing a lot of work the last couple of weeks because I was noticing certain feelings come up. And I was talking to Jim and I said, Jim, um, and I was trying to explain how I feel. I'm like, is this anxiety? I don't know, because I'm not the anxious type, you know, so I don't know what anxiety is, but but could it be this? Because it's a really uncomfortable feeling. I don't know, is, could it be this? Could it be that? Could it be, you know, so my mind is going on, going, what could it be? What could it could it be? And I'm like, and where did I get it from? Who did I get it from? Can I give it back? Um, <laughs> you know, and 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 so then I just started just being there with the feeling. I'm like, I'm like, on one hand, if you're not afraid to die, how can you have fears about living? It just does it's, it doesn't even make, you know, it doesn't even make sense. I mean, that's the big one. Dying is the big one. And if that doesn't bother you, then what what could possibly in this life trouble you? I mean, it doesn't make it doesn't. It doesn't make sense, you know? And so, you know, I get a lot of advice from a lot of different people and I'm taking in, you know, advice and considering what they what they say. And I'm like, you know, I'm gonna have to get some of this back. This is it's definitely not mine, you know? Um, and so we can easily get in to that, into a place trying to help, uh, so many people that um, that we can start to like just you know pick up. Um, well, it's not that I have don't pick up other people's feelings, but I know that it ain't mine, you know. But then I started getting in the space like I wasn't really wasn't really sure. I mean, just the it doesn't make it doesn't make sense mm -hmm. to me, honestly. And so um, um, we have to decide for ourselves what makes sense at, at any time. The same way we have shared shared prajna, you know, we also um, there can be shared there can be shared in ignorance. That's why uh, my uh, my sister had a German shepherd, and she was bipolar. That dog got bipolar too. Uh, he he really did. They un ended up having to put him down, um, and he picked it up from her. But he was, you know, vicious. He he became vicious, and one minute he was fine with you, and the next minute he was attacking. He was attacking you just just like you know, just like she did. So that's why it tells us to be careful who we spend a lot of time with, who we hang around with, how what we. Um, um, and make sure that what you uh, that you really have the capacity to do what you're trying to do um, to um, to help and 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 support and that you know your limitations and one doesn't have to be guilty about having limitations if you got them, you got them, you know, uh, and so. Know your own stopping. Know your own stopping point, um, and take time to nurture. Take time to nurture yourself. Um, I mean, I am recognizing that I need to step back and 
takes some time. I don't want to, number one. Number two, I think that times are so urgent that you should do and, uh, everything you can for as many people as you can, you know, as often as you can with all the of the capacity that you have. That's my standard, you know, but I'm also recognizing that I need a I need a break and I find it very difficult to accept because my choice is not to not to break. That's my that's my um that's my choice. So I have to ask myself, well, is it because you only know how to go? <clears throat> you don't know how to stop. You know, so I have to ask myself, you know, I know I can go, but do I know how to stop? Um, and I don't know because I um, haven't taken time to ask myself that question. <laughs> and, uh, and now, and now I must. Um, and so we we have so then maybe um, I have to readjust my view or my idea of uh, yeah my ideas of my my views around around that. Anybody else? Yes. I just wanted to undermine a statement you made that was really true to yeah. have made. Uh, you said pride in a self revealing state of not, not knowing. I had a, an experience the night of the election where uh, when we went to bed, it uh, really looked bad. And I made the mistake of uh, when I got up to go to the bathroom, checking the phone, and it had gone from bad to worse. That was what my mind was telling me. And I went into, uh, didn't get back to sleep the rest of the night, but went into kind of a twilight state. You know, that kind of drifty, in-between kind of state. And what came to me, it wasn't, wasn't a voice that was talking or a spirit talking or anything like that. It's just that um, in, by allowing this, to be just what it is, that a portal opens into the great mystery. And that was the way I kind of conceptualized it. That that portal is opening all the time, but especially at a time of chaos, disappointment, uh, all of this stuff swirling around, that there's an opening there to simply lean in to not knowing. And that the, the, the worst that one can do is to try to cobble together some kind of alternate security equation in order to feel safe. And uh, that's what I've been trying to live into since then. Mm -hmm. Staying with the not knowing and allow it just to be. You know, we want change, you know, but then we we either think we know what we need to effect effect that change, which is what we've been trying to do. And it doesn't mean that some things that we've been trying to do are not good, but it could be the timing could be wrong. The acceleration of it, you know, like too much, too fast, that creates a push that creates a pushback. 
for one who's of a of a different mind. And so, so um in but in order for there to be change, you know, there has to be some dissolution. Di not disillusion, dissolution. Some things have to fall apart. You know, they they really do. And then we are afraid about, you know, we're trying to prop things up and keep them from falling apart. Well, we might just need to let it fall apart. You know? Yeah. Um, and in our not clinging to it being the way it was, we can envision how to build something new from the pieces that that we had that we had, you know. And if all of our energy is going into future future pacing around fear of what might happen, you know, um, Kay and I were talking today about Dr. Oz being appointed, you know, and Kay was like just having a conniption over it. And I was like, I'm, I'm okay with Dr. Oz. She says, no, no, you know, because she's a, a staunch uh, believer in uh, Western medicine and allopathic medicine. And she thinks basically, except for a couple of people that she personally likes, that what uh, whatever alternative they're practicing is quackery, you know. Uh, if she likes you, she might like go with what you're doing. Like she, you know, she likes uh uh, she accepts feng shui because she she loves um, Judith, right? You know, but anything else around Chinese uh, uh, and she, and him, you know, with his acupuncture or his energy, what is he? But everybody else, mm -mm. and so. Uh, but I I was I was just thinking about it. I said, well, I like Dr. You know, so maybe I'm, maybe he might not be one hundred percent kosher around some things we need to keep in place. I said, but maybe what he'll do is he'll open up a, a an avenue by which more alternative practitioners can have an easier rally. And maybe it's just for that window of allowing something to become mainstream, you know, and then we'll have to get back to fixing something on the other side of on the other side of that. I mean, you know, I'm just saying that we don't know, but if we spend our time, you know, uh, giving life to aspirations that are helpful. Then maybe we would be participating in a much be better way, just energetically, vibrationally, and 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 uh, so forth. And so that goes for in our personal life, goes for our life with our friends and family. It goes for life with uh, strangers, people we don't know. It, it actually goes with how we should conduct our life, even with our in our enemies. Uh, but because we don't think that there is any power in projecting that way towards our enemies, we result to the same measures that they project towards us. So we like really fuel and give energy, you know, uh, to these uh, un unwholesome, to the creation, the proliferation of unwholesome states. And I'm not talking about having a Pollyanna mentality, you know. But it's just a simple question of do you believe that there is a capacity and power in good to effect uh, change, uh, positive change in the world? Uh, I mean, they certainly believe in their in their badness. You know, do we believe that our good has any power, any authority uh, uh, in the material world? And I do. I believe that it does um, because I have seen it. Work so otherwise you just talking. I I ran into a, a, a lady the other day after the retreat was over. I call myself uh, that's what happens when you do good. I call myself rescuing um, Soma because she'd been talking to Soma for two hours, you know, and <laughs> and I call myself just trying to rescue Soma. But I don't know what happened. But you know, just trying to be cordial and and step in. And she immediately jumped up and excused excuse herself. Um, and uh, and then she talked, the woman talked, you know, for for two more hours, I think. I said, you know, and um, 
And I said, you know, you are definitely uh, an encyclopedia of other people's um, thoughts. Okay. You know, <laughs> and she, I don't think she got it though. Probably take it as a compliment. <laughs> I think she, I think she did. Uh, you are truly an encyclopedia of other people's thoughts. So I don't want to be that. You know, I want to know my own mind. I want to know the strength and the power of my own mind. I want to be able to subdue the unwholesome thoughts and uproot the negative seeds that have been planted. You know, in this mind through um, my actions have been these ways that karma comes to maturity and and falls and falls away. So, you know, you don't have to always be happy, go lucky, jumping up and clicking your heels three times. We can we can think soberly um, and we can hold situations and sometimes it's best to just hold them without talking about them. Uh, you know, and just looking, there's a difference in in looking you know, or observing and thinking. One requires us just be present, be fully here. It is here, you know, and to be fully present with it as opposed to thinking about what are we going to do or, um, or, or speaking negatively about it and fanning and fanning the flames. And if one can keep one's mind peaceful in that way, then I think we are making right use of whatever uh, capacities we may individually possess. Yeah. I want to share one thing. The section you read was almost like an extended version of the sixth and seventh step of the Bodhicitta Dharma and the Dharma of Cultivation. It was like you don't. You don't contrive, you're not doing good on purpose, you do everything naturally. And then by that, you enter into emptiness and tranquility by letting go of self and dharma. So if any of you like do that meditation, you could read that and like get more of an understanding of, I don't know, but it it's like the exact same thing, but just longer and more. Because I go over the same words every time I do the meditation, but that's like an explanation process of how it And comment on you mentioned contentment, and uh, so yeah, so there's there's this there's this sense of kind of ease with this this idea that you know so and contentment is is something that arose. For me. You know, we can try to be content, but you know, we you can strive. We know how so. Kind of it arose for me in the summertime and then it kind of you know went away for a while and then it's arisen these last several weeks again and there's just this sense of ease and i find that it sets a backdrop for the afflictions and hindrances and our faults because against that backdrop of ease everything else anything else is a contraction and you can feel it right and then you can go what's that Right, so it's so all of a sudden the path gets easy because all I have to do is look at that contraction. I go from an expanded kind of you know sense of ease to wait, what is that now? And then you know all of the things that we study in, in Buddhism, you know, especially you know in the Majjhima Nikaya, uh, is this beneficial or not beneficial? And all those different things and all the lists of how to behave and all that stuff. We start out sort of you know kind of trying to identify those and trace those back and see like, you know, when we start on the path. And so this seems like all this. But now I find with this backdrop of kind of ease and contentment, all I have to do is identify that contraction. Then I can trace it back to one of those things. But I have a, it's almost like a measuring system. It's like a, it's an instrument. Well, the body's an instrument in that way. So you have an instrument. The opposite of that is where, we, where I came from, which was the backdrop 
is all the tension and the anxiety and all the self-concern, and once in a while we get a glimpse of <laughs> and that's remarkable, right? We write poems about it and you know, all that. So, so it's just it's 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 a nice it's a nice break when the ten minute rides. <laughs> I remember a woman was she died uh, shortly after she she was on um what's that singing show the voice. Uh, no, American uh, AGT, uh huh. And uh, she had uh, cancer. And a young woman? Mm -hmm. oh. um, birds, bird, birdie, bird, birdie, no, a bird, uh, bird song, bird song, bird song. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, she wrote this song, It's Okay, It's Okay, It's Okay, It's Okay. It was a song she wrote, she was so beautiful, you know, and uh, over you know a few months as she began to decline really 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 fast you know uh, but she like really touched you know she touched millions and millions and millions of people who watched her you know her demon her demonizing and um, so you know, they do an annual um, you know remembrance on AGT of her because she taught people uh, through her example how to um, how to live in in the moment and how to um, you know to accept uh, and, and when she got to play she could hard she was like this and she kept falling you know um, and she had just been this robust singing you know uh, and uh, it really touched it really touched. So we don't know how we uh, affect others. All, the only thing we can offer is not our words. You know, it's just the life that we, you know, you know, just wanting to live the life that we sing about in our song. That's that's yeah, what authenticity is. Just living the life that we speak, that we talk about. Yeah. She's a night bird. Night bird. Night bird. Night bird. Night bird. Yeah. It's amazing. It truly is. Okay. Did, I saw your hand move, but yeah. I was reflecting um, about, I've had this sense of ease for a long time. And I'm wondering how much of it might be avoidance. Mm -hmm. That I, I will just, I'm, I'll make sure not to look there. That's oh, really nice. I just won't look there. And, and you know, and, and, um, and how because I can let things come and I can let them go. And that may be because say, yes, I might not go over here now and just avoid things. And so that's what I try to sort through my own mind. That that that's a, a good point, you know, because nobody can tell you what it is for you. You know, we think we know what it is for everybody else, right? But really, nobody can tell us because I, you know, actually, that is a training guide. When one is, is over here and it's causing, uh, it makes one disconcerted and discontented. Then he says, then then look here. So it really is a good quality to be able to to not go over there. I guess, I guess, you know what. Just because somebody says to me you're avoiding, you know, it's a thing to deliberately choose not to engage something, you know, and person can can say that it's avoiding, but is it avoiding for you is the thing, you know, because avoiding has a kind of disease. So if you have, have mastered a quality, you know, um, I think it's a very good quality to have to be able to turn shift the mind and turn it to what to uh you know with, and two kinds of thought you know, you know he talks about it's a rare quality for people who are able to turn it from one thought to to the opposite 
uh, to the opposite door. Um, but uh, it, how, it, how it works its way out lets you know if it's avoidance, if it's something that, that if you ad addressed it, it would make it better for everybody, you know, because you are the one to say it, then you know that it's, it's a avoidance. Or is it creating a situation where it actually hurts or harms someone because you, um, because you're the one who has to fix it, you know, or you're the one that that needs to give some action to the to the situation, uh, or if you don't want to because you want to be liked, you know, uh, but it creates uh, an unwholesome situation, then you could I, you could say this is this is a avoidance. So you have to look at all of the other um you know qualities that are that are swimming all around all around it and that's how you can know some of us need to apply just looking in the other direction or resting you know in the equal and opposite space uh usually um more disciplined people can can do that and I know I'm not a very disciplined person so uh, that wouldn't be my thing, avoidance, because it it takes you know some some strength to just try if to try to see it in a different way. I I want to fix it, you know. So if I'm the fixer, then just being able to just look oh, look over there, you know. But if I uh, if I have a, of a different personality. You know, in a different pre um, um, disposition, then I need to to look at that. So usually, I go with uh, whatever I think that's the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, I do. I'll first thing that talks about it. That that's not it. <laughs> yeah, and you'd be married to the avoider, <laughs> so you know. Think back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They like the fixers. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's how we can how and 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 then to like really uh not be afraid to to see that in in our in ourselves, you know. Then we find that our shortcomings are really not anything to be afraid to see, you know. To just really want to see them. Yes. That that uh I, I think you maybe said it to Lucita and then she said it in a talk, but it was something along the lines of like really and, and it's in, in the um you know the blue book, it's something along the lines of like yeah. really seeing others' faults as our faults. And I'm coming to a place where I'm realizing uh we, where I'm, this is for where I'm at. I think there's gradients and levels to this, but where I'm at. No one's going to be perfect. And if, if we're standing in our judgment, it's, it's really taking the positionality. You know, in the heart of the, the heart of life, the heart of the, the Lodom teachings is that we use whatever obstructions, judgments are arising as the raw material for awakening. Mm -hmm. And when we can just soften into that, just that, I'm finding that's a huge step. Because then we're not running from our own experience. We're pushing towards an experience that's not what ours is. Or strangling the space that allows someone to really be who they are. Mm -hmm. And that's a very different way to walk in the world. And what I'm finding is to the extent to which I can surrender my positionality, which doesn't happen through talking, it happens through downshifting, holding space, remembering my aspiration, really living, understanding that Virtue is like a corkscrew. 
that opens and decants something deep inside of us. Mm -hmm. And what I'm finding, this is the, this is the part that is just what I'm finding is that as I'm doing that, some of the extraneous thinking is washing away. Mm -hmm. And that's where the ease that Joe talked about, that's where it comes from. For me, anytime I'm not in ease, it's because I'm I'm riding me the thought train without realizing who's driving it. So this is really a practice of of you know how or examination of how to let go of driving the train, how to let go of think of thinking, you know. Um, Holding space doesn't mean like literally holding it. Holding, holding space is, you know, being in a space of, of uh, uh, non-differentiation. You remember he talked about uh, the the five aggregates being equal, and what what does being equal mean you know but the aggregates drop into uh one one aggregate like drops into a place of ascendancy ascendancy when we are examining thinking judging you know and it was like just pull that one back a little bit and the minute you pull that one back then they are all equal and and the space you know in the space Open, opens up. It's no longer my job to fix you. You know, it's no longer my job to point out where you're wrong. It's no longer my job to judge you. It's no longer my job. You know, I, I really don't have a job in it. I, um, and um, and that takes us a long way towards being being you know content contented. Uh, we. Um, uh, when uh, Bill's uh, 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 yeah, trailer burn uh, caught on fire the, the other day, and uh, on, I think it was on Saturday, on Monday morning, when I was coming home, and I was like, okay, so as soon as I get home, um, we're gonna, you know, we'll figure out how how to help them. But an email went out and was saying, like, does anybody have a place? And I said, we gotta pull that back um, because we can't ask anybody. To take him to help him in that way, I I wouldn't. He can't live, you know. He can't live in anybody's house because he can't follow a rule, you know. We say no smoking. We say okay, we don't smoke anyway. We said, you know, I mean, it'll, it's things like that. So you, you can't like set somebody up to to help and support us. And and I never asked anybody to do anything that I myself wouldn't. Do. Wouldn't do. He completely tore up the room that we gave him uh, at Hartwood, and so, but that's all right. I mean, he's been fussed for seven years, and that was one unit he could totally destroy. And we just renovate, you know, that one that one room, and he did totally destroy it. Um, we went to the uh, when we were away, and we were renting a house when we were singing, mm -hmm. and he took a shower and let the water run out the shower, <laughs> out the bathroom, and down the hall, you know. And so so we know that he has a kind of limited capacity, so we can't ask him. I said, I want I won't can't, can't take it all, you know, and so that's just that's just that's just it. So sometimes we have to know what our limitations are. Um and we have to uh, be okay with what we with what we what we can't do. So um I um I'm praying that this uh trailer that I saw yesterday for twenty five hundred dollars is is available. You know, because I think we can raise twenty five hundred dollars to get him a trailer, haul the other trailer off, and then he's back, you know. Um the and uh and something like that. So I'm gonna write all the people who wrote me uh, when the uh, flood came, saying, "Can I? Can I help? Can I do anything for you?" No, but you could help him. 
you know, because um, it doesn't take much for us to be able to do that. He's handled me really, really well, you know, because uh, he knows that we help him, you know, and he has that uh, where he can rely on on us. He tries to be as, as independent as he possibly can, you know, um, uh, but he's not quite as independent, doesn't have quite the capacity to be, you know, as independent as he as he thinks as he thinks he is. So it gets a little bit difficult sometimes to try to, you know, um, help him. You know, uh, he he's so super intelligent. He really, really is. Um, and so so it's, it's it's difficult. So he called called me last night. Or I called him last night. To see how good it was. I was fussing with him because he's in a really nice hotel. You know, and we helped him get a driver's license. I'm, I mean, a, a ID, a, a you know, a legal ID. You know, uh, last year, and because um, he didn't have anything, anything like that. Uh, and so I was saying, I'm so glad because I'm not trying for even for him to have a hotel for one night. You know, where I'm gonna be on that hotel because he's liable to tear it up. You know, and. Uh, um, but he was able, you know, but he was able because he now has a driver's license and we got him, you know, debit card so he can go and buy things. And, uh, and he was able to, and he felt, you know, sort of in charge of his own life in this emergency. But he just wanted to tell me, you know, that uh, if, if I can help you do anything to uh, fix everything, let me know. <laughs> That's all. I said, okay, but I said, how you like in the, the uh, hotel? I said, oh, this is really great. You know, but I I, I was fussing with Kadar because it was like, I don't want him to be in a really nice hotel because then he starts thinking that that's uh, what he should have, right? That's the standard for him for him now. So I was trying to find like a kind of ratty one, you know, um, because he's going to have to go back into this really kind of close to you know, small, small in, in environment. Uh, um, but uh, anyway, you know, I'm encouraged that we're going to find something, something for him the next two days. And we talked to the guy who has the trail park uh, and we let him know that we're going to come and clean it up and get all of that fire debris and all of that stuff gone in the next couple of days because he's the first trailer when you come into the park and he already has like I don't know 10 or 15 bikes, bikes and all of that you know so I was thinking that we could, whew, I'm like I don't want him to be it was hard finding a place you know once they meet you then they decide that they want to rent to you so it was hard finding a place that would take him you know to right. begin with you know once they once they met him uh, so I wanted him to know that, that we're gonna, gonna we're gonna get it cleaned up right away and and put him put him back uh, and get him back there as soon as possible. So you all keep it in your in your prayers. And, uh, thank you so much for coming today. May you be well and happy and peaceful. No no harm come to you and no danger. May you always be able to meet the inevitable difficulties of life. Mm-hmm.